Okay, here we are in module number seven. Can you believe it? We are almost halfway through. <clears throat> Pretty amazing how time flies. This module is not technically intensive. It is much more, uh, it's all focused on the legal system. And while at first that may seem boring, because it has, it doesn't deal with any technical things like we have been in the last couple modules, yet it is important to know the legal system, how it works, at least in a, in a broad sense, and have an understanding of various things that affect us. Uh, so, the structure of the U.S. legal system uh, cases are tried by their state and federal laws. You have a jury, the group of people under oath who hear arguments at a trial and render a verdict of guilty or not guilty. You have the plaintiff who initiates the lawsuit and is responsible for the cost of litigation. The defendant is the person who defends themselves in a lawsuit. The origins of the U.S. legal system is there's a common law based on case law and precedent with laws derived from court decisions. Precedent is court decisions that are binding on future decisions in a particular jurisdiction. Therefore, these laws are derived not from legislation, but from court decisions. Civil law is based on the uh, Napoleonic Code, based on Roman law. Civil law is based on scholarly research, which becomes legal code and enacted by legislature without precedent. The three primary bodies of law that exist in the U.S. are the constitutional law, the statutory law, and regulatory law. The constitutional or federal law outlines relationships between the three federal branches while protecting the rights of the citizens. Statutory law is written law from legislature at a national, state, or a local level. These are codified, or the statutes that are organized by subject matter, and uncodified law. So you have the, the two bricks, either they're codified or uncodified. Regulatory law governs the activities of government administrative agencies, such as tribunals, commissions, and boards responsible for decision-making that affect the environment, taxation, international trade, immigration, and so on. This picture is of the U.S. court system. Understanding the structure of the court system provides better understanding the rationale for cases being tried in federal versus state or county courts. The, basis, the basic structure of federal, state, and local courts is the same. A defendant has the right to a fair trial with the outcome determined by a jury of his peers. The role of the judge is to facilitate the trial process and ensure that the proceedings are in accordance with the law, along with ensuring that the proceedings are free of prejudice and the innocence of the defendant is presumed until proven otherwise. The burden of proof is always on the prosecution. We have the appeals courts. These courts enable its citizens to appeal a conviction, deciding whether to hear an appeal. Appeals are not trials. A panel of judges renders a decision whether a mistake occurred in a lower court. One type of federal court, uh, yeah, under the federal courts, there's one type that derives from Article 3 of the Constitution, consisting of district courts, circuit courts of appeal, and the U.S. Supreme Court. The two other types of Article 3 are the U.S. Court of Claims and Court of International Trade. Those do not have general jurisdiction. And then, of course, we have the Supreme Court. The president is responsible for appointing those federal judges, approved by the Senate. 
it is for life unless removed by impeachment. The judiciary branch is the ultimate arbiter of the law, not Congress or the President. Article 2 of the Constitution outlines the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court and other federal courts. The Federal Appeals Appellate Courts. There are 13 of them established in the original states. There are 12 regional circuit courts as well as an additional federal circuit court in D.C. Each of these is assigned a circuit justice from the Supreme Court. These courts can refer cases to the Supreme Court with three judges sitting in each of those courts. The district courts are 94 and uh, are all over the U.S. Every state has at least one. Most federal cases, like the criminal or the civil, begin in the district courts. For example, kidnapping or intellectual property cases. There are state courts, and those vary at each state. Local trial courts are located throughout the state to hear cases at lower levels. If the defendant is guilty, they can appeal at their state appellate courts. Uh, those are the highest courts for the state judicial system. They have discretion over which cases they hear and often refer cases where there could be an error in determining the law. Those are confined to particular jurisdictions and preside over contentious decisions like elections. Uh, there are also some intermediate appellate courts. They are in almost all states. There's 10 who don't have them. And those vary. Okay. There are a couple other courts to be aware of. The ones of limited jurisdiction, like the probate, which are things like surrogate court, hearing cases related to distribution of the deceased assets. There's a family court that handles child custody, visitation, support cases, restraining orders. There's traffic court <clears throat> for all things driving. The juvenile, the small claims, and the municipal. In the courtroom, drink of water, uh, it's helpful to understand the pre-trial and trial process. Usually, it's a nine-step process of jury selection, oath and preliminary instructions, opening statements, testimony of witnesses, closing arguments, jury instructions, deliberations, verdict, and sentencing. Uh, the right to a trial by jury is outlined in the Sixth Amendment. Uh, the, the process of picking the, the jury is there as well, where the lawyers and judges can ask potential jurors questions for any biases that could influence their partiality, impartiality in the case. Because again, all defendants are presumed innocent until proven guilty. Uh, the different types of courts will have different amount of jurors. Some cases will require jurors to be sequestered or isolated to prevent any external influences on jury decisions. Contempt of court means violating the rules of the court procedure. The foreperson is the first juror seated and is ultimately responsible for reporting the verdict to the judge. During a trial, the prosecution goes first since they have the burden of proof and must prove guilt. The defense must not prove anything. Under the Fifth Amendment, which we'll talk about in a bit, the defendant does not need to even speak during the trial. Uh, the two forms of examination are the direct, uh, questioning uh, the counsel's witness in a trial. The cross-examination is the opposing side examining the, the witness at a trial. In regards to verdicts, Deliberations is the process where the jury reviews the evidence and discusses opinion about the case. A hung jury occurs when the jury cannot come to a unanimous decision 
and a retrial must occur. This is not necessary in a civil trial. The jury also decides the, uh, the compensatory issues in a civil trial. And it's always the responsibility of the judge to determine the sentence. Here's kind of a breakdown of what falls under uh, criminal and what falls under civil in regards to how the trials happen. Criminal charges are initiated by the government, prosecutors on behalf of the people. A defendant is indicted to stand trial and answer questions related to a serious crime or provide information. A felony is a serious crime and generally carries a penalty of at least a year or more in prison. A misdemeanor is a less serious crime, with a possible sentence of less than a year. A deposition, or sworn testimony, sworn witness testimony taken during the discovery phase, which is prior to the trial, is generally not taken for criminal cases. Civil cases can be presented with them. Civil cases can be brought by an individual or an organization, referred to as the plaintiff against an individual or another organization. Civil trials generally involve disputes over money. If successful, the plaintiff is awarded money by the jury. A civil trial identifies whether an entity failed to act reasonably and prudently under a certain set of circumstances or the preponderance of the evidence or most of the evidence presented indicates which party was in the right or the wrong. Now into some of the constitutional law. Uh, the way that, that I made that page is I gave you a, a section of the amendment with some uh, with a few notes and then some cases that you can read uh, more about and I did my best to find uh, some articles or, or some connections that you can you can check out but you could research on uh, Google the the cases so the first is the First Amendment uh, though the First Amendment which uh, the section that I have here reads Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. Though this was written long before digital communications, we rely on the Supreme Court and lower federal courts to interpret what protections a person posting a, a, insulting comments has, along with the rights of the victim. Can any opinion, no matter how disturbing, be posted on a blog? Is there sometimes a difference between moral responsibility and constitutional law? The Fourth Amendment. The, the quote from it. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. That's the uh, quote for that. Uh, the Fourth Amendment protects people, not places. One of the issues that arises with the Fourth Amendment is the expectation of privacy. A link clearly exists between unreasonable search and seizure and the expectation of privacy but the Supreme Court has not always been clear about the linkage, which causes confusing and case law is the best guide for litigators. Uh, for example, one gray area is expectation of privacy in the workplace. Uh, there's a few other terms to be familiar with this amendment. There's the exclusionary rule, evidence seized and examined without a warrant, or in violation of individual's right will often be inadmissible as evidence. There is the fruit of the poisonous tree, a metaphorical expression to describe evidence that was initially acquired illegally. All evidence subsequently gathered at every point from that initial search becomes inadmissible. Uh, this next one I don't really know how to pronounce. 
Sererorari? Uh, it's an order made by a higher court that directs a lower court or a tribunal to send it court documents. And then there's motion in Lyman. Lyman? Request by a lawyer to hold a hearing before a trial in an effort to suppress some evidence. With the Fourth Amendment, we must talk about search warrants. It's arguably the most important part of the Constitution for forensics investigators. Law enforcement must obtain a search warrant. This is a court order issued by a judge or magistrate authorizing law enforcement to search a person or place as well as seize items or information within the parameters of the warrant before a search can be carried out. Investigators must demonstrate probable cause, which is conditions under which law enforcement may obtain a warrant for search or arrest when it is evident that a crime has been committed. Warrants are specific to a particular crime and criminal investigation. They are specific to a geographical location. For example, if a house borders two counties, two separate warrants are necessary to search the entire property. Uh, it, uh, so in one case law, law enforcement was issued a warrant to search a house, but the suspect's computer was located in a shed in the back of the house, which was not in the warrant and thus not permitted to be seized. There is some warrantless searches. Since the USA Patriot Act, law enforcement has greater powers extending warrantless searches when a person's life or safety may be in danger. The, the Department of Justice does provide some guidelines for warrantless searches and seizures of computers. When appropriate consent is granted to a government agent, a warrant is not required. Consent can be granted when an individual waives his or her Fourth Amendment rights. The search is limited to physical area of the individual's authority and to a specific criminal investigation. A warrantless search is also subject to the totality of circumstances. The individual granting consent must be of sound mind, an adult, and educated with a certain degree of intelligence. Some law enforcement use the knock and talk without sufficient evidence or if they cannot demonstrate probable cause to enter a resident to execute a search. Law enforcement can go to the suspect's home and try to obtain the consent of the individual to gain entry and conduct the consensual search. There's also the plain view doctrine allowing government agents to seize evidence without a warrant when the officer can clearly observe contraband. The officer must be lawfully present in an area protected by the Fourth Amendment. The evidence must be in plain view, and the officer must immediately identify the item as contraband without further intrusion. Search warrants never allow investigators to conduct a general search. Here's a couple more terms. There's the plain error. Appeals court identifying a major mistake in court proceedings, even though no objection was made during the initial trial in which judgment was passed and a new trial will be ordered. There's the rules of criminal procedure. Protocols for how criminal procedures, proceedings in a federal court should be conducted. The search incident to a lawful arrest allows law enforcement to conduct a warrantless search after an arrest has been made. And standing, a suspect right to object to a Fourth Amendment search. So now moving to our, our realm, when does digital surveillance become a search? Stingray is a generic term for a device that acts like a cell phone tower to locate criminal suspects, but can also locate people in disaster areas like in earthquakes and hurricanes and so on. A pen register is an electronic device that captures telephone numbers. These require law enforcement to show only the information retrieved is likely to assist in an ongoing investigation. 
pen registers are not searches. In a specific case in 1979, the Department of Justice admitted it conducted a search but contended that there is no expectation of privacy when using a cell phone. The prosecution, the prosecution stated that a court order, which is an issue by court and details set of steps to be carried out by law enforcement, did allow investigators to capture real-time data from Verizon. So yes, using a cell phone, uh, you don't have an expectation of privacy. GPS tracking. GPS tracking devices are prevalent and widespread in their legality in the four. For example, it's not illegal for law enforcement to attach a GPS tracker if the area does not, uh, not pass the done test for curtilage, an enclosed intimate space. Uh, two quotes from two different cases. Uh, first one is U.S. versus Knotts. Monitoring signals on these devices does not invade any legitimate expectation of privacy on the respondent's part, and thus there was neither a search nor seizure within contemplation of the Fourth Amendment. The surveillance amounted principally to following an automo automobile on public streets and highways. A person traveling in an automobile on public thoroughfares has no reasonable expectation of privacy in his movements. In a different case, U.S. versus McIver, there is an interesting quote. The undercarriage is part of a car's exterior and as such is not afforded a reasonable expectation of privacy. So um, if you have a driveway and it doesn't have a fence, it's perfectly fine for law enforcement to uh, walk up to your car, attach a GPS tracker, and walk away. That's perfectly legal. In 2014, a case of Riley versus California, the US Supreme Court ruled that police require a warrant to search the cell phone of somebody who is arrested. This was a landmark decision for law enforcement and forensics investigators because the cell phone can no longer be searched uh, incident to arrest. Whoops. I just kept reading and I didn't, uh, I forgot that I had these. How a stingray works. Here's a stingray system. The GPS tracking that's totally legal for law enforcement to do. There we go, Fifth Amendment. This amendment, uh, which reads, or at least a section of it, no person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia when in actual service in time of war or public danger nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be witness against himself nor be deprived of life liberty or prosperity or property without due process of law nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. This amendment protects the individual from self-incrimination. A defendant is not compelled to testify at a trial and may plead the fifth. An indictment is a charge delivered by a grand jury, relatively large jury that determines whether the conditions exist for criminal prosecution, stating the accused must stand trial. Investigators must be sure to have gathered all the necessary evidence before the case goes to trial. Fifth Amendment can influence the outcome of computer forensics investigations. For example, forcing a, dependent, a defendant to supply a password is forcing the defendant to provide testimony because the defendant is conveying his knowledge, like a known password or PIN, to access files within an incriminating device. 
Conversely, a suspect can be forced to use his finger to unlock a laptop or a smartphone. Biometric access is not protected by the Constitution. So uh, Face ID, uh, Touch ID, anything biometrics related, you can be forced to unlock under the Constitution. If you don't want your cell phone to be unlocked by law enforcement by legal force, then do not use any biometrics anywhere. Because they can't force you to, uh, to convey your knowledge, you know, to, to give out the, um, the contents of your mind. Yes, so if uh, <laughs> you're going to steady heartbeat to unlock a phone, yeah, you, you don't want to use biometrics. If you, it, for whatever reason, you don't want, you know, if you feel you may do anything that you may run in with law enforcement, for the, I mean, first of all, don't. Don't get yourself in trouble with law enforcement. But if you do for whatever reason, if you don't have biometrics on, they can't force you to unlock your phone. Uh, the Sixth Amendment doesn't really impact computer forensics investigators in law enforcement very frequently. But it does have a confrontation, confrontation clause uh, that forces investigators to appear in person. So moving from the amendments over to some congressional legislation, like the Federal Wiretap Act. This law states law enforcement is prohibited from using wiretap without a judge's permission. A wiretap is authorized by the Justice Department, signed off by a U.S. court or a court of appeals judge, and valid for 30 days. Under this law, service carriers may on occasion monitor and intercept communications to combat fraud and thefts of services. This law was amended by the Electronic Communications Privacy Act of 1986 to include transmissions from a computer. The Stored Communications Act uh, there, under it, there are no Fourth Amendment protections when using an internet service provider or an email provider. Stored communications is defined as any temporary intermediate storage of a wire or electronic communication incidental to the electronic transmission thereof, and any storage of such communication by an electronic communication service for purposes of backup protection of any such communication. Applying that Stored Communications Act is uh, problematic since law enforcement operating in one jurisdiction is granted a search warrant, but a service provider is headquartered elsewhere, with actual servers possibly in another location. Through rulings based on this law, you should have a diminished expectation of digital privacy in the workplace. The Foreign Intelligence Service Act, Surveillance Act. This act outlines procedures by which electronic surveillance may be carried out to protect the U.S. from international espionage. It was amended by the Patriot Act to add terrorism, which may not be state-sponsored. The use of pen registers and trap and trace devices in foreign intelligence investigations is found in FISA. The Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. This law invokes stiff penalties for those found guilty of unauthorized access to a network. Uh, Section 814 of the Patriot Act <coughs> made several amendments, like increasing the maximum penalty to hackers who damage computers to 20 years in prison, include intent to damage a computer 
rather than the type of damage, and new offense for damaging computers used for national security or criminal justice. There's the corporate espionage a law, which also covers things like computer trespassing, committing fraud with a protected computer, distributing passwords of a government or a commercial computer, and damage to a protected computer. The Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, uh, or CAL-LEA, telecom companies were forced to redesign their infrastructure to meet compliance to this law. VoIP operators are not subject to this law and might not be able to assist law enforcement with investigations, as VoIP has no switches on a network and therefore provides a technological challenge with using a wiretap. Now, I've been mentioning this law here and there. Let's talk about it now. The Patriot Act, born out of 9-11, it provides greater power to law enforcement to prevent terrorist acts from reoccurring. Law enforcement can conduct surveillance without judicial approval in certain circumstances. This law has impacted digital forensics. For example, if law enforcement receives an email from someone who's been kidnapped, they can act without the use of a warrant because someone's life is in danger. Here are some sections to be aware of. Okay, just making sure. Uh, the section 202. Authority to Intercept Voice Communications in Computer Hacking Investigation. Section 209. Voice messages are no longer protected by the Fourth Amendment. 210. Subpoenas can include records of session times and durations, any temporarily assigned network address, obtain credit card and bank information for internet users. It also compels ISPs to provide complete details about incidents. Uh, 213, the sneak and peek warrant provision. Search a home or business hastily without notifying the target in advance. Prevents a criminal suspect from tipping off other criminals about an imminent search. 216, extends pen registers and trap and trace statute to non-content information to the internet to include IP addresses, MAC addresses, port numbers, and user accounts. 217. An individual victim of unauthorized access by a hacker can allow law enforcement to intercept the communications of the trespasser. The user has the right to also intercept communication but must meet four conditions. And they are the user or owner of a protected computer must authorize the interception of communication. The person who intercepts the communication must be lawfully engaged in the ongoing investigation. Reasonable grounds to believe that the interception of a communication will assist in an ongoing investigation. And investigators must only intercept the communications of the trespasser. 220 compels ISPs to hand over email records outside the jurisdiction of the investigation and 816 the attorney general can create regional computer forensic labs and continue support existing labs isn't that fun there is the protect act this act provides greater protection for children against abuse Eliminates waiting periods for law enforcement to begin investigating missing persons 18 to 21. Eliminates statutes of limitations for child abuse or kidnappings and prohibits computer generated child porn. The DMCA, there's four titles to it. Title one is, is the World Intellectual Property Organization uh, who does copyrights. Uh, for uh, for things like music. T 
Title II, the Online Copyright Infringement Liability Limitation Act. These are all mouthfuls. Creates limitations on the liability of online service providers for copyright infringement when engaging in certain types of activities. Title III is the Computer Maintenance Competition Assurance Act. Creates an exemption for making a copy of a program by activating a computer for the purpose of maintenance or repair. And Title IV, six miscellaneous provisions relating to the function of the Copyright Office, distance education, exceptions in Copyright Act for libraries and making ephemeral recordings, webcasting of sound recordings on the internet, and applicability of collective bargaining agreements, obligations in the case of transfer of rights in motion pictures. This is the act that's used if for copyright infringement. Cloud is not related uh, to cloud. It, the federal legislation obliges U.S. tech companies to allow federal law enforcement to obtain data stored on servers domestically and internationally with a subpoena or warrant. It hasn't been ratified by other countries, like the EU, but it's there on our books. The rules for evidence admissibility are three, the Fry test, Daubert, and federal rules of evidence. The Fry test comes from a uh, from a case, Fry versus the U.S. Expert opinion must be derived from a thing and must be based on science that is uh, that's not experimental, but you can totally demonstrate. The Daubert test is based on Daubert versus uh, Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals. Computer forensic investigators must perform benchmark tests on their hardware and software tools. This testing will enable the investigator to explain any known error rates. The federal rules of evidence <clears throat> determines admissibility of evidence in a federal or a, in a federal civil or criminal case. And it also has the section with expert testimony. Speaking of, testimony that is not firsthand is hearsay, a statement other than the one made by a declarant while testifying at a trial or hearing. And thus, it's inadmissible in court. But interestingly enough, the exception is for digital evidence, allowing an expert, to, an expert witness to provide his opinion during a trial or deposition. which can be used as evidence. Both defense and prosecution can use their own expert witnesses and cross-examine the opponent's expert. As usual, the goal of the defense is to discredit the expert, the testimony, the evidence, the tools and science methodology used to gain concessions. Uh, under the federal rules of evidence, all parties in a trial must disclose the witnesses they will use at a trial and an expert may bring their own exhibits to the trial. There are federal rules for civil procedure that apply to civil cases with expert witnesses. An expert witness must provide a written report to a trial. Disclosure of an expert witness is an important part of discovery. And uh, the reports have to have a certain amount of, of items. There are even rules for the hearsay. Uh, that determine like email, spreadsheets, system logs, uh, records that are created in the normal course of business are admissible in a federal court. Digital evidence is not hearsay. Um, for criminal defense, as a reminder under the Sixth Amendment, all defendants must be given the right to defense counsel at the end of the day. If expert investigators lawfully and scientifically acquired incriminating evidence and the findings are presented appropriately, the prosecution should be successful 
if the defendant is guilty. Lastly, <clears throat> the European Union, China, and India. Apart from Ireland and the UK, the legal system of most European countries is based on Roman law, uh, people, property, and acquiring, or, yeah, and acquiring property. The EU consists of 27 countries in a dual legal system. Each country has its own laws and the EU law. The EU Commission or the executive body can propose legislation and initiate legal proceedings against member states. The Court of Justice of the European Union is the highest court in the EU. With them, we must talk about the General Data Protection Regu Regulation or GDPR. It stipulates how companies or entities must handle records of EU citizens. Fines can be as high as 20 million euros or 4% of the global annual turnover and the law limits the amount of data a company can collect about a consumer. For example, a company can only collect personal data that is necessary to complete a transaction. It can't be used for another purpose or sold to a third party. The company must clearly state its privacy policy and data sharing agreement in full. The rights of the individual are right to be forgotten, access to their personal data, amend incorrect personal data, transfer data from one provider to another. GDPR makes a distinction between personal and sensitive data. Personal data can be name, email address, IP address, mailing address. Sensitive data <coughs> information can be race, ethnicity, political opinion, religious, philosophical belief, trade union membership, genetics, biometrics, health records, and sexual orientation. Please do not underestimate the impact of GDPR. With the limits on data collection and retention, a criminal investigator may have more limited access to personal information for corporations. If a U.S. company has an employee in Spain whose laptop was stolen, it could be problematic to check if the laptop was compliant, like encrypted. A local and GDPR legislation impact whether the investigation must take place in that country, whether the data can be transferred back to the U.S., and permission sought for, from the employee to investigate a laptop owned by the company. There are a number of questions that need to be asked uh, when it comes to a crime happening with digital equipment in the EU. So it's highly uh, recommended to get a, a attorney who is knowledgeable in GDPR. My short one sentence for China is China has arguably the greatest restrictions on internet content and the government closely monitors content that its citizens view with like the great firewall uh, india in april 2011 introduced the information technology rules which protect the privacy of online consumers and it's important to know that this legislation does impact u.s companies that outsource services to india its primary tenets are the privacy policies, consent, consumer access, and editing, uh, transfer of data, of personal data, and security. And this is just a brief look at other uh, nations and their laws. Any questions from this uh, big data dump? about the law.
Okay, seeing none, I'll stop this recording. Oh, wait. The work this week. The work this week. Is doing some rooms in Trihackney. <clears throat> At least four DFIR related rooms. Obviously, don't do the same ones. And again, you always show proof that you completed it. And also a third case. But this time, you do not have a quiz to do. You will be uploading a file that answers these questions. So no more racing to copy paste. You'll just submit a document to answer these questions with all the files you need and of course the same location for all the case files. As always, I highly encourage you to work together. I, I will further encourage you to work together. Form teams. Knock this out together. It is in no way, shape, or form cheating. You will not get penalized by me for working together because I have been continually encouraging you to work together. I do not believe that you should be doing these, these cases on your own. I highly believe you should be doing this with at least two other people because these cases do get intense. There, there's a lot to look for. And in the real world, a, a, uh, an investigator doesn't do this on their own. It's usually a team because you have to scrape through data because you have to look in, in a lot of places. That's, that's why this is done as a team. So I further push you to utilize Discord to your advantage, to talk to one another, to solve stuff. It's perfectly fine. For example, in this document, stick all the names of everybody who worked together. You're not, uh, you're not, um, you're not hurting yourself. You're helping yourself by like, if, if I, if I was the student and I had this list of questions that I need to solve, yeah, I would be asking exactly like Hema going, Hey, who wants to work with me? Cause I'd be like, okay, I'll take the, the first five. You take the next five. Uh, you take the next five and work our way down the line. That's perfectly fine. And in no way, shape or form, uh, cheating or, or anything negative. That's what we do in digital forensics. We work together. So yeah, you'll have some DFIR rooms and another case to work on. And this is all prep for the second half of the course where it's going to be a, a lecture and then you're just working on cases. So that this is why, again, I, I consistently remind you and I consistently encourage you to utilize Discord to its full potential and talk to one another to get through the content. Now I'll stop the recording.